Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and Friends of Baylor. Well, uh, today we're really lucky because we're going to have one of our superstars, Tony Piedra, come and talk to us about influenza. You remember we talked about RSV uh, uh, last week, and it's very exciting, or two weeks ago. And uh, so, you know, influenza is really uh, hitting us hard these days, and I thought we'd take some time to just talk about influenza. So, yeah, as, I've done this before, but if you'll recall, there are four types of influenza virus, A, B, C, and D. Uh, influenza A and B viruses are the ones that cause the seasonal epidemics, and uh, only this A uh, virus really causes uh, global pandemics. C is uh, thought to be a pretty mild disease, and D is mostly uh, in uh, cattle and not in humans. And as you'll recall, we, influenza is really, they're characterized by their subtypes based on two proteins on the cell surface, the hemagglutinin and H and the neuraminidase N. So H um, variety and N variety. And there are 18 different hemagglutin subtypes and there are 11 different neuraminidases. So if you look at the way it's characterized, you mostly have influenza A, and the biggest subtypes going now are H1N1 and H3N2, and influenza B, which are defined by where they were isolated, uh, Victoria or Yamagata. So those are the major uh, strains, and the way people refer to these, the scientists refer to them, is pretty much the type of virus, where it was located, the strain number, the year isolated, and then the virus subtype. So that's how we, uh, You'll hear all these H3N1, H3N2, this stuff. That's how we're characterizing the viruses. So I want to show you a COVID map because it's really interesting. Very little COVID in the Southeast United States right now. As you compare that to flu, which is, I showed this a couple of weeks ago, really hot in the Southeast. So the opposite of what's going on with COVID. And from there, it's beginning to spread from the Southeast to the rest of the country. Uh, what's really interesting is the flu season started very early and very aggressively this year. If you look at this, this is previous flu season years, and you can see 2020 uh, and 2021 uh, in pink and brown here uh, really didn't have much of a flu season, mostly because of all the things we were doing to avoid COVID. Uh, social distancing, wearing masks, washing hands, all the things that are very important in transmitting flu virus sort of just eliminated flu for the last two years. This is what we're saying this year. And as we eliminated all those sort of public health measures, you can see flu has come back pretty aggressively and earlier than usual. These are the usual spikes. Those are in years from pre-pandemic uh, pre years, uh, 18, 17, 18, and 19. You can see they were later in the, in the fall versus now, uh, which is what we're seeing an earlier and more aggressive flu season. On the outpatient side, again, in contrast to COVID, this affects mostly the very young and very old, but the very young are the real ones that are being seen a lot in doctor offices. So this is zero to four years and five to 24 years with the older ones down here. So most of the outpatient visits for respiratory illness are being seen in flu in younger kids. And if you look at the inpatient um, <clears throat> volume, it really started early. This usually is a November, December spike, but here you can see it started in September. And again, this gives rise to, if you look at pediatric deaths, uh, virtually nothing for two years, and now we're beginning to see a smattering of uh, pediatric deaths due to pneumonia. So this is a really interesting uh, graph from the CDC. It shows all deaths <clears throat> due to pneumonia, influenza, or, or COVID-19. It does not break out RSV separately. And what you can see is that blue is the COVID uh, mortality, and you can see most of the deaths tracked along with COVID. That's why we knew COVID was a pandemic and really bad. But what we see now is look at this, very little here in 2022, but the red line is still high. That, and, and the, the influenza numbers aren't very high in this particular graph, that's mostly RSV, which we talked about before. We can expect this graph to start going up based on influenza deaths. Uh, if you look at what subtype, mostly it's, uh, if you look at the influenza A, it's 99.5% of the viruses, influenza B, 0.5%. And this is a graph of what has been really driving the most recent spike in, in the flu pandemic. It is on 99.5%, the yellow bars are influenza A. What sub subtype? Well, in red, it's H3N2 mostly, uh, in orange, H1N1, and in A, they have not been subtyped, but my guess is they're proportionally the same. So mainly it's being driven by H3N2, and we're gonna find out from Dr. Piedra if that's in this uh, year's uh, flu vaccine. 
This is the map of Texas, and you can see the yellow ones are where it's influenza A. The rest of the ones in dark and darker blue are not categorized, but you can see most of Texas is actually beginning to be pretty hot, particularly in Harris County. So we're seeing a lot of influenza. So well, we're going to have Dr. Piedra come and talk to us, uh, and we're really excited about that because he has a lot of knowledge about influenza. We're lucky today to have somebody who actually knows something about flu rather than me just talking about it. Uh, our famous Dr. Tony Piedra, who runs um, the vaccine uh, treatment unit as well. So I'm going to ask him some stuff that uh, people have been asking me, and maybe we'll get some insights into what's going on today these days with flu. So first of all, uh, Tony, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Nice to see you. We were shaking hands. It's a step in the we're in back to normal contact. Uh, first of all, can you tell us what the vaccine treatment unit is? How When did it come into being, and what does it do? So the vaccine treatment evaluation unit came uh, to existence in, 19, or in the mid-1960s by Dr. Couch. And for many years, he was the principal investigator. And their major focus was to evaluate vaccines, in particular vaccines against influenza. Oh, nice. Over time, that has changed. And in recent years, they made a, a major contribution in evaluating the messenger RNA vaccines against SARS-CoV-2. Yeah, and I noticed uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, your team was very on top of a lot of the testing and also uh, making, you know, basically doing some of the evaluation of the new vaccines. One of the questions uh, that's come up uh, a lot uh, from my friends and colleagues is, how do they decide each year on uh, what to include in the vaccine for flu? No, that's an excellent question. There happens to be a, a global network uh, for influenza looking at what's circulating in many, many countries and regions throughout the world. And there's the World Health Organization and a number of other major laboratories, including the CDC, that evaluates what changes, what drifts are occurring. And based on what is changing, they will adapt or, or uh, modify the type of antigen that's going to be included. And almost every year, one to two uh, vaccine antigens are revised. And this year, it's, uh, it's three antigen or four antigen? How do they decide that? So this year, they're all four. All vaccines have four different antigens. And it happened, we're going through an interesting transition. There are two major subtypes for influenza A, H1N1 mm -hmm. and H3N2, and two major lineages for influenza B, the Victor Victoria and the Yamagata. Well, it happens that we're not seeing a lot of the Yamagata at this time. And so we're wondering whether that may have disappeared uh, during the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Mm -hmm. We'll know with time. But those four different types are intended to cover the four major viruses that circulate. And, and based on what we're seeing, uh, I showed the folks earlier, uh, it seems like it's a pretty good match this year. Is that right? It's a very good match for the major viruses that are circulating, and that in particular is the H3N2 and the H1N1. And, you know, what's also kind of interesting to me is it's really going to, it's been a very bad flu season. And in the last couple of years, we really haven't seen much flu. What accounts for the sudden emergence of flu? So that's another excellent question. And I'm and going to attribute that to my sister since it's an excellent question, Janet. Go ahead. And, and it will be part had to do with what we did to help prevent uh, infection with SARS-CoV-2. So we had a lot of non-pharmaceutical interventions, mm -hmm. such as social distancing, wearing masks, good air exchange, and so forth, and taking care of how we mingled, let's say, during the holidays right. or with family. And so that actually had a major impact on other respiratory viruses. And when vaccines came around and we basically reduced a lot of these non-pharmaceutical interventions, we started to see, again, the, res the common respiratory viruses. Right. But what has changed is the epidemiology. And so this year is a good example where we're getting a good mixture of influenza, of RSV, of SARS-CoV-2, and other respiratory viruses that are all commingling at the same time giving us a major headache, as we see. <laughs> yeah, and now that we've shaken hands, I'm going to have to go wash my hands because we're back to transmitting it by contact and other things. So uh, it's getting up to the holiday season, lots of family gatherings. Any advice about what to do either with older grandparents or younger children in, when you get together as a family? I think this is a, an excellent time to remember to be vaccinated. So we have vaccines against SARS-CoV-2, and it's time, if you have not, to receive the bivalent booster uh, vaccine. And the same thing, we should have been vaccinated against influenza, but mm -hmm. if you have not, 
this is an excellent time to be vaccinated to try to safeguard against two major respiratory pathogens. You cannot protect against the other viruses that are also circulating. So here you mm -hmm. have to take a risk assessment. And if you're older, think well uh, when you're going to see young children because they will have many viruses. And if you want to protect yourself, think about how you protected yourself during SARS-CoV-2. That's great advice. Appreciate it. And thank you for joining us today. Uh, I really appreciate your insights and uh, look forward to the future success of the VTEU. So thank you, Dr. Piedra. Thank you very much. I want to end today with a bunch of shout outs. Uh, it was a really uh, great Thanksgiving. We really had a great time. And I want to do a particular shout out to the owners of 33 Danny's Market and Star Stop Chevron stores across Texas. They have installed special Baylor College of Medicine branded gas pumps. <laughs> and now we're pumping gas. Uh, through the end of the year, five cents on every gallon purchase will be donated to our pediatric brain cancer research efforts. So uh, if you're looking for participating stations, here's the, the address uh, shown below. I also want to give great congratulations to Dr. Cheryl Hughes, Teresa O'Connor, Ricardo Quinones, Binoy Shivana, and Yong Su, who are faculty members in the Department of Pediatrics have all been named to the American Pediatric Society. This is a big deal because those members have really distinguished themselves as academic leaders, teachers, researchers, and so I'm really excited about them. Thank you. I want to thank them for being such outstanding members of the faculty. And of course, the most important shout out for the week is to my Michigan Wolverines who stomped Ohio State. Uh, go Blue. And I want you all to have a great, uh, great uh, weekend and I can't wait to see you next week.